Hi, everyone. We've set up this Being an Engineer podcast as an industry knowledge repository, if you will. We hope it'll be a tool where engineers can learn about and connect with other companies, technologies, people, resources, and opportunities. So make some connections and enjoy the show. One, two, three. Rebel Rally is an off-road navigation competition. I've been training for just about a year. It's been really empowering to meet a bunch of badass women. Can I say badass? I am in the R1T with Lily. She really brings a spunk. A whole bunch of women doing things that a lot of society thinks that women can. Hello and welcome to another exciting adventure here on the Being an Engineer podcast. I am super excited for our two guests today, Alex Anderson and Lily Macaruso. Alex and Lily are both engineers at Rivian, an innovative automotive company specializing in electric vehicles and known for its commitment to sustainability and cutting edge technology in the EV market. They recently competed in the Rebel Rally, which is the longest off-road rally in the United States, an eight-day 1600 mile test not of speed but of endurance technical driving and precision navigation using only a map and compass alex and lily welcome to the show thanks for having us having us so i i really truly have been very excited for this episode because i am totally a rivian fanboy i uh i own a rivian r1t and people ask me sometimes do you like the truck are you happy with the rivian and Honest, my my answer is always it's the best thing I've ever bought, and that is one hundred percent true. Um, it almost I'm just going to gush for just another thirty seconds, and then we'll move on to the true purpose of the show, which is talking with the two of you. But it feels like driving a work of art to me. You know, they they say that art is valuable because of the way it's supposed to make you feel. Traditional art, painting, sculptures, that sort of thing has never really done that for me. But when I get in the Rivian, I always smile. And I, it's just a pleasure and a delight to drive and own this vehicle. So gushing is over, um, but I, I love Rivian. I love the brand and so excited to talk with both of you about the Rebel Rally and all of the engineering that went on behind the scenes to produce this amazing vehicle that that allowed you both to um, to to win the rally. So with that, maybe we can start um, with Lily and then Alex. Let's just talk about what what made you decide to become an engineer. Oh, well, uh, first off, happy that you enjoy our trucks so much. We do as well. That's why we sat in them for so many days and so much training. What's uh, what's your configuration? It's the adventure configuration. Uh, like uh, like color. Like, do you go off roading in blue. it? What? Blue. Yeah, it's blue. I've done some off roading in it. Um, mostly I, I just, I love driving to work in it. That sounds kind of lame, I know, but that's most of the driving I do. And it's just such a pleasure to drive. So it's interesting. You brought the comparison of art into it. Uh, I also never fancied myself into uh, traditional art. And then I took up TIG welding because so many project cars uh, required help. So, <laughs> uh, and that's whenever I also started to feel more connection into engineering and art in that sense, because it takes more than just solving the solution or solving the problem. It takes creative solutions. And I think that's where we get to be artistic, which isn't art to most of the rest of the world. Cool. Um, did, did you want to answer his question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I got into engineering because I first went into medicine and I wanted to be able to work on cars and pay my way through school. And it turned out that racing and working on cars and engineering was more fun. So I left pre-med two weeks before my MCATs testing and then went into school for a focus of engineering and high performance racing. My dad gave me a high five and I think my mom had a heart attack <laughs> That's awesome. in the most supportive manner possible. Um, I got into engineering. I think it was, it, it was a long time coming. Um, I attribute it a lot to Um, how my parents raised me. Uh, My dad and I would tinker kind of in the shop a lot, whether it was working on like wood projects or like Lily said, welding or such like that. So I just really started to develop the spatial skills young. 
And then um, my mom, I think, developed more of the personality skills to be a woman in a male-dominated field like this. So she taught me how to stick up for myself um, and and really just hard work ethic. Um, so from there, I learned more of the engineering skills from uh, FIRST Robotics, um, started learning CAD, manufacturing, machining, um, and really got exposure to uh, other professional engineers. Um, and and me and my siblings really are uh, like the first generation of uh, my family to go to college and to graduate. Uh, so I didn't really have that exposure to more of like a higher education early on. So um, being able to be in first robotics and see like what what else is out there was uh, was really cool. Um, so from there, I went to the University of Michigan uh, and studied mechanical engineering uh, with a concentration in manufacturing systems and then uh, learned everything I needed to work for an automotive company like Rivian. Terrific. All right. Thank you. My son uh, does first uh, FLL, first Lego League. Awesome. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll have to tell him that uh, Rivian Engineers did first Lego League too. He'll be really excited. Oh, you should. It, it honestly, I anyone that has a kid, I always tell them, get them into first robotics because it leads to so many learning opportunities, scholarships, grants. Uh, I, I really recommend it. Yeah. They just made it into the States, actually. Congratulations, oh, congratulations. Jones, if you're listening to this. <laughs> Well, Rivian is a a newer company in the automotive space. So for those who aren't familiar with the vehicle, can um, either one of you talk through a little bit about what it is and and why it's unique from other production vehicles out there today? Go ahead, Lily. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So what makes us unique is actually our brand and how we interact with it. The same way that you said it felt like a piece of art uh, and it's all very cold materials. How did that make you feel? I. What makes us different is the fact that we're brand centered. Anyone can take apart our car. Anyone can learn our systems, figure out. I mean, it would take a lot of reverse engineering, hopefully, because we've hopefully put so much time into it. But it's more so the amount of intention we put behind the brand of it. I mean, there's definitely the engineering side of problem solving and looking into different ways to control power, like our braking is controlled and our quad motors via power instead of your traditional braking. So coming up with new innovations is definitely awesome, but in the long sight, it could actually be reverse engineered and everyone can figure that out. So what makes us different is the fact that we look at it as our product is in service to other people. What are they actually taking it out for? And how do we go break it as many times as possible and validate it as many times as possible in these crazy scenarios? So that way, whenever you take it off-roading or whenever you take it to the track, you experience a truck or an SUV or a product that you love. I I love that answer. And I can tell you that for me, um, I have experienced the intentionality behind that brand. I, I want to go outdoors more because of it. It almost feels like this safety net, you know, that I, I want to take out and it's it's going to take care of me. It's going to baby me out there. And I love that about it. Um, let's let's move on to the Rebel Rally. So for for those uh, listeners who don't know who, what it is, Alex, can can you talk a little bit about what is the the rally? Like, what are the goals? What are the rules? What are the, the parameters? Um, just a, a quick, you know, 30, 60 second overview. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the Rebel Rally is an eight-day competition, and it is all off-road with very minimal highway transits. So we are going just about 1,600 miles off-road in our vehicles. Um, on top of that, it is map and uh, paper map and compass-based navigation. So we don't have our phones with us. We have no contact with our family. Um, and we need to navigate through all of this terrains, mountains, valleys, sand dunes, um, with paper map and compass. Uh, so we're chasing checkpoints throughout the day, and it's not a rally based off speed, like how fast you get to these checkpoints, but um, rather it's it's how close you get to the very center of the checkpoint. So it's a bullseye. Um, there's sometimes a big green flag there, and those are more safety points. Uh, there's blue checkpoints, which are a little harder to navigate to. And then the black checkpoints, there's nothing there. You just have to terrain associate, look around, uh, trust your distance and heading. Um, and then the closer you get to that center of the bullseyes, the more points you get. Amazing. And uh, this this is for women only. Mm-hmm. Did that change the dynamic of the competition, do you think? I don't think because it was women only, it changed the dynamic of the competition. I think it's the, I guess, the way that they 
instill interaction between competitors. Um, so a lot of the competitors are also trainers for the rally. So they have their own private trainings that they host outside and they they really try to share their knowledge and passion for off-road. Um, so Nina Barlow was one of our trainers and I remember she was the first one that taught me how to, how to chase a checkpoint and how to plot it on a map. Um, and then out on the rally, she was the one that was helping us. We helped her sometimes. So there's really a, like a cooperative atmosphere that's been established. Nice. And did each of you have different roles as you were going through the competition or did that switch back and forth? Were they unique roles? How did that work? Lily, you're smiling. You you have something you want to say. (laughs) Oh, she does. (laughs) So in the rally, it's a, we have to put each other before ourselves. You own 100% of everything that's happening possible as your own piece. So I primarily drove and, and Alex primarily navigated, but it doesn't mean that if we missed something or we were too far off, I then looked at her and went, I can't believe you did that. It was we made decisions together that entire time and we got each other there. Like there was one time in which, so essentially you're looking at a paper map and there's little squiggle lines and you're just trying to interpret the different squiggle lines and their colors and hopefully a distance and you just set a direction you try to go. Now, a certain squiggle line could be a very big road or it could be a path that someone took 20 years ago whenever they made the map. So we get to a very big road and all of a sudden about halfway down it, it just becomes a massive boulder field. And I'm talking boulders the size of our tires. So most people would say, okay, we turn around, we find another route. Alex and I are very committed in the sense of, no, like how how long could it be a boulder field? It's okay. There must be just a little bit of wash and it'll be great on the other side. Two hours later, it was still a boulder field. <laughs> <laughs> so then we have to traverse a boulder field to then get to what we thought would be another road. And it's a power line road. Fun fact, also wasn't a real road anymore. And so it's these scenarios in which she feels bad because she thought it was a an actual road. I feel bad because I also didn't turn us around. And we own that moment together. And it's knowing those soft skills as you would kind of hinted at earlier of just because I have feedback to give doesn't mean that in this exact moment, it's going to help us in any shape or form. So in those roles, both of us can do either skill. She's a phenomenal driver, but she chooses to navigate. I'm a moderate navigator. It's phenomenal. Don't let her. (laughs) But I drive the car because we each respect each other in that sense. So purpose roles, but respectfully can do both. And and we very intentionally trained up that way. Um, so so we competed last year, um, and last year we did the majority of our training alongside uh, some of our other competitors. Um, and each and every one of us trained as a driver and a navigator. And that decision to break off, um, it was it was natural in our setting, uh, but that wasn't decided until much closer to the competition. Uh, so we would be able to relate to each other's roles, have sympathy for each other out on the course. Um, and then if something happens, know how to take over for the other person and vice versa. The best way I could describe it is any engineer who's had to wonderfully work with a studio team. They are very focused on design and aesthetic and how it's going to make someone feel. And an engineer is like, but it doesn't work. So it can be the most beautiful piece of art, but it doesn't function. So imagine constantly trying to be both of those pieces at any given moment and just imagine getting to work with someone in studio that also fully understood engineering logic it's pretty great that we both went and did both sides because it just made the conversation much better easier and more solution driven yeah that makes a lot of sense uh alex you had talked a little bit about the training tell us a little bit more about that what what was the training like? I, I imagine that Rivian didn't just let you stop being engineers for a while so you could devote yourselves full time to to training. How did you how did you find time? How much time were you able to spend? How did you manage that, you know, training, work, life balance, all of that? Yeah. Uh managing work life balance. I don't know if we did that. <laughs> um, <laughs> we did not. Okay. Sure. No. So training for the rally and then obviously competing in the rally, it's a full-time job in itself. Um, and then on top of that, I work on the body exteriors team and Lily is on the special projects team. 
Um, we both have very demanding and time consuming jobs. Um, but one thing that was really helpful, um, at least in, in my scenario, my, my team really supported. Uh, everyone on my team was extremely eager to help out. Uh, they took some of my pre design presentations to the people that needed to approve them um, in my absence. But um, yeah, so last year we trained up for about eight months. And I want to say it was about a one week per month that we were out in the desert chasing checkpoints. So to only be at your full-time job 75% of the time, um, other people definitely had to step in. And, and there was a huge support network back home for us. Nice. Lily, anything you want to add to that? Yeah. So training not only came from us, it was this decision of what are our goals and what do we want to achieve very early on, because otherwise we're just kind of roaming around in the desert and you can be better or you can be worse. But we actually set the goals of we didn't want to get any penalties because essentially that's like demerits. You can control if you were on time or not, your own time management. You can control if you sped or not. Sometimes because our car really likes to go fast. So that's difficult to not do. Uh, <laughs> well, I didn't realize there was a speed limit. What was the speed limit? Oh, so it was day dependent. Uh, so on average, it was about 85 kilometers. So like imagine 60 miles per hour, roughly. But that's 60 miles per hour while off-roading. If you could do 60 maintaining up a canyon, like by all means, you own a free runner. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty fast <laughs> off-roading. Yep. So certain sections have higher or lower speed limits, and it also pertains to the type of permitting they have. So there's certain areas in which there are animals in the area like tortoise, rare desert tortoise that you can't touch, you can't move, you can't do anything with. And if you come across it, you essentially just wait, literally wait on a tortoise. So <laughs> did, did you see any interesting wildlife out there for eight days? Oh, my God. I still have this image in my head. It was last year, and we're in EV, so we're silent. So when you come up on animals, they yeah. they don't get spooked the same way they might in a nice vehicle. Um, and I remember looking out my passenger window, and there was two wild horses running oh, with no us. Way. And, I, and no I'm not joking. Way. The sun was in their mane. Oh, my like, gosh. It was the most gorgeous scene. <laughs> and I'm, like, freaking out looking at these horses. And Lily's like, I need to focus on driving. Amazing. It was wow, beautiful. Wow, what an experience. Yeah. It's uh, – it took a full intention of what we wanted to do and what we wanted to accomplish. And then the amount of trainers and people that believed in us internally and externally. We trained with Nina. We trained with Bill Burke and his team out of Grand Junction. So it was a very intentional of who knows how to do this because we don't. And how do we figure out how to accomplish that? So training was great. There's also another animal story in which we were off-roading and there were... So you're in the middle of nowhere and there's these cattle gates. And you're like, yeah, okay, I can drive through these. and But you don't always see cattle based on where you are, especially the more prominent off-roading areas. And I'm in this highly technical area. We had just passed through a cattle gate and the brush is as tall as our vehicle is. And a cow's head just pokes out and Alex starts screaming. And I'm thinking I'm <laughs> about to kill us. <laughs> I was so scared. Oh. <laughs> Not because of a cow. Let me let me make that clear. It was just because there was this massive object moving at my window and my window was down. <laughs> so I got so scared. <laughs> yeah. So it's moments like that. <laughs> that reminds me of a story, just very quick tangent here. Um, my son, when he was really young, had, um, uh, let's just call it a, a medical episode. He's fine now. Everything turned out great, but it was, he was fine. Anyway, he was in the hospital for a day or two. And the doctor said, um, this, this might happen again. Kids who have this, they tend to have it again. So be on the lookout for it. Anyway, we came home from the hospital and, uh, a day or two later, I hear my wife screaming and I'm thinking, oh no, it happened again. Right. So I'm, I'm panicking, freaking out. And I run out there and I said, what's what's going on? Is he okay? And she says, there's a bird in the house. There's a bird in the house. <laughs> I'm like, come on. Really? That's what you're yelling about? <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So you know the fear. The <laughs> I, you know I, the fear, know but the fear. Sure do. Well, I'm glad to hear your son's, the son's okay. I'm glad it was Thank you. Fear. Yes, yes. Um, uh, so speaking of, of other creatures out there, did you encounter other competitors during the rally or, or is everyone kind of isolated? So 
It depends on the day. You essentially all start off on the same start line most of the time, unless you're self-camping. But most of the time you start and end at the same place for safety measures. Also for the camaraderie, if you go do this thing for eight days and never see another human, it, it's already isolating. <laughs> so if yeah, you don't see the already isolated people, uh, and it depends on where you are. Some of the checkpoints are easier. Some of them are harder. So typically at the easier ones, you'll kind of have like a, they're meant to be a health check. They're off a big road. They should be very easy to get to. And it's to make sure that everyone's okay. And so there we would see a lot of people, but you get to a black diamond checkpoint and there's nothing notating that anywhere. And you might see a couple of other people and you kind of judge how far off they are from you. And then you also like have to trust your gut of, okay, well, there were a couple of times where we would look at other people and we'd go, oh, well, they they just must be wrong. Like, of course we're closer to it. Like, <laughs> we know exactly where we are. And sure. then we would click our tracker and then it'd be a big slice of humble pie. And we're like, nope, we're right. Then you just keep driving. <laughs> so you have what, some kind of GPS unit. And when you think you're on the mark, you you click it and then it tells you if you're close or not. Is that how it works? Correct. So we have uh, Iridium satellite trackers in which essentially is only it only spits out a time and a location based on GPS coordinates. So that's the only piece of in, like technology that we get to interact with for the entire span of the rally. And you guard this tracker like it's your child because it controls <laughs> your points and your systems and yeah <laughs> at one point ours malfunctioned and it showed us a degree off and a degree off in a lat long like we're not even in like we're not even a kilometer within the right place and to be that far off would be like if you're trying to make something have a like a con um like a torsion force and then all of a sudden it's a compression you're like hmm not what I was aiming for. <laughs> like, it doesn't calculate. Yeah, and and to add to that, um, that is the most stressful like twenty seconds of our life when we click the tracker and then we're waiting for the coordinates back, and y y that's when you know whether or not you wide missed, which means you get a penalty, or with it, or if you're within that bullseye, essentially. Um, so when, like Lily said, when our tracker malfunctioned and we wrote okay. that down, we freaked out for a good twenty minutes. And we're like, where are we? We don't know where we are, and then. We, we did a sanity check. We looked around. And we're like, no, this photography <laughs> makes sense. We're on top of a mound. There's a mound at 90 degrees. There's another mound at 110. Um, and we trusted our gut. And when we clicked again, it, it was right. So um, a lot of it, yeah, it was just taking in as much information as oh, we could. But, uh, it, it did yeah. turn out we were right then. But many other times we've been like one mount, mountain range off. So <laughs> oh, She makes that sound like a very calm story. She hiked a mountain three times and then called into our dispatch Holy and went, cow. this isn't okay. And they went, yeah, but our, our end, it, it shows you it in the didn't. right place. And we were like, cool. For us, it didn't. So, <laughs> <laughs> How did your relationship with the vehicle change over the course of those eight days? It definitely is a relationship. That's a good word to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> Our truck even has a name each year. Last year it was Linda. This year it was Timmy. So terrific. Mine is Eleanor. Oh, well, that's such a good name. That it's classy, really right? It's very really regal. Like for a exactly Caribbean. So I I think that's very her. That's really good. Uh, so for us, I would say the relationship escalates in the sense of. We've been out in trucks and SUVs and our product a lot and have a lot of seat time validating these vehicles. And anything can still happen. I mean, you could have the one car that has the percentage of never happening or the near zero possibility, and it could still happen. I mean, it's nothing is perfect. And to be in our vehicle for that long and have that amount of trust, I, every night we would still go into the mechanic's pit and walk through our vehicle because it's a health check. It would be crazy if you didn't. And Everyone would just, because we're the new EV on the block, so everyone would come up and be like, what broke? And we're like, nothing. Absolutely nothing. We're just trying to check and make sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's a, it's a really common phrase in the rally to call the vehicle your third teammate, and that couldn't be more accurate. Um, Lily and I have a huge level of respect for each other, but we also have an even huger uh, level of respect for our truck, um, because if we didn't, it, it it wouldn't have made it through eight days if we didn't have mechanical sympathy, um, if we didn't know how to take specific lines or what to put the vehicle through. It it wouldn't have made it, and that's that's any vehicle out there. 
Um, so having that mutual level of respect for your vehicle um, and like Lily said, doing those checks every single night, um, not damaging it, it was it was really important. Well, let me take a a very short break here, share with the listeners that our company, Pipeline Design and Engineering, develops new and innovative manufacturing processes for complex products, then implements them into manual fixtures or fully automated machines to dramatically reduce production costs and improve production yields for OEMs. Today, we're speaking with Lily and Alex at Rivian and talking about the Rebel Rally, uh, of which they were the, the winners this year. And you, this is your second year competing in the rally. Is that right? Yeah, this is our second year. Last year was um, our rookie year, and we received actually the rookie of the year trophy. Um, we got fourth place last year. Which is no small feat. I mean, fourth place your first year. I, I think they're, I'm not, I'm not going to guess, but there are quite a few competitors, right? It's not like there are four competitors and you got fourth place. But there are, I don't know, 50, 100, something like that. So on average, there is about 60 teams or so that come and compete. And it's a badge of honor just to finish the rally, let alone be able to place well in it. It's a badge of honor for a manufacturer. It's for us to have the mental rigidity and that much cooperation between all three things together. But most people go to just be able to finish, not even place in the rally. So for us to then understand that we made fourth because, oh, by the way, we don't track our ranking during the rally. So we look at essentially you get a list in the morning of all of your checkpoints. And then at nighttime, you get a list of your personal accuracy. And that's what we would look at to make sure, okay, were we close to this point? Were we further away? How do we make sure we can do better? But it's such an individual run your own rally event that if you're going to go get another checkpoint just because another team is five points ahead of you, you'll make yourself crazy. And we're highly competitive people. So we knew that would run us dry. I'm sure that there were some uh, technical advantages maybe in the the Rivian just because of how it's engineered. I'm curious, and, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But before we get there, were there any were there any challenges uh, associated with the fact that you were driving an EV, not an ICE vehicle. I, I, I imagine charging maybe was was one of them, but w- what else was was challenging about driving a, an EV in the rally? Honestly, I don't think we were at any sort of advantage or disadvantage because we were, we were in an EV. Um, we were one of the smallest classes out there. There was six EVs and then the rest of the 65 vehicles um, were, were ICE vehicles. Um, but charging was actually, we only ever received charge when the fuel vehicles received fuel. Um, so most of the time that was at night after you had completed your 30 checkpoints for the day, um, all of our vehicles would go into this impound and the fuel vehicles would get filled up and then our vehicles would charge overnight. And that was all completed on um, all green hydrogen. Uh, so a truck came in with I think 800 kilograms of hydrogen or pounds or kilograms, I could be wrong. <laughs> Um, and, and our vehicles charged off of all that. So that was, that was incredible that Renewable Innovations was able to make that happen this year. And then, um, on the longer transit days or the days like, um, dunes where a lot more energy is consumed, uh, the fuel vehicles and the ice vehicles would receive like a midday splash. Uh, so that would be either a couple gallons of fuel or just 20, 30 minutes of charge. The Rivian has some different drive modes, and uh, one of them is off-road, and and you can actually adjust the the ride height of the vehicle as you're driving. What were some of the terrains that you had to drive over, and and, and did the different drive modes uh, help you in those terrains? So it's a very versatile course. You start This year, it was up above Mammoth. By the way, no one knows the route or the rally until the day of. We only get to know the start even like a month or so ahead of time. And then we know the finish as they announce it as well. Historically, it's been in Glamis. So the amount of terrain difference in that you're looking at mountains, you're looking at sand, you're looking at short highway sections, you're looking at a lot, a lot of dirt roads, which we are definitely up for. But to your point, the different drive modes not only made it more capable, it also made it more comfortable. I've off-roaded a decent amount in life. And just to be able to sit that long and not need to be out of the car or move around a lot, 
there's still a bit of that. You can't just sit still forever, but it's definitely makes it where you can offer longer and it's quieter. So you're not getting more fatigue just based on engine droning noise. It's a lot smoother. And then you have so much more control as a driver, almost what feels like from going to an ICE vehicle into an EV, you're essentially just flexing your foot just a little bit to be able to control. And once you figure that part out, it's so, so much better. And then also you have regen. So it's so much more controllable. Yeah. Alex, anything to add there? The Yeah. The only thing I would add there is, like you mentioned, there's so many different types of terrain that we will see in the rally. It's, it's eight days um, and almost the entire length of California. We're going over rock crawl, sand, and the Rivian has a mode for each one of those. So the torque it's applying to the wheels, how it handles uh, the suspension differently, it is perfectly tuned for that environment. So we're able to switch that with just a flick of a button. Um, and you can really feel it in the vehicle. It If it starts to get kind of hung up on a rock and you just keep constant pedal and apply, you can feel the vehicle think and get out of those situations um, really well. That's amazing. I love the engineering behind it. What what were a couple of the most challenging situations or, or problems that you encountered and had to overcome? <laughs> oh, man, which day? <laughs> <laughs> Your pick. You know, I think... All of the challenges that we had to overcome, we we really had faced in training. So it was just relying on our training and knowing what to do when we got into that. Um, I don't think anything was a crazy technical train that we couldn't drive or get out of. Um, it was really just the time pressure, the stress, uh, not uh, killing each other out on the course, <laughs> um, and knowing how to work out as a team um, after eight days of very little sleep and very little showers. Um, but I think we communicate very strongly. Um, anytime there's an issue, we, we addressed it head on. Um, and it wasn't, we had such a strong common goal that it wasn't worth dwelling on um, anything that may have frustrated us. I frustrated her all the time, to be clear. She <laughs> does all goes the other way, way too. <laughs> oh, she, she, she does it so beautifully, but there was, there were definitely conflicts and it's how you get through it on the other side. But if we just agreed with each other 100% of the time, we would either be really, really good or really, really lost. So having that conflict and disagreement not only helps you understand who you're with, it also gives them trust that I'm not just going to sit here and know that you're failing. We are trying to accomplish this together. So how do we make sure that we talk through it? Uh, there's actually a story to which Alex probably hates, but whenever we were first doing training, it was our very first training. And the way that we bring people in was essentially you start out with a wilderness first aid because there is a very real side if something happened medically, you're out in the middle of nowhere and the first responder on your scene is your teammate. So you you better take great care of them and appreciate them because that's the person who could potentially save your life. And so we go through this first aid before we start going into off-roading. And at the end of the training, Alex looks at me and goes, what kind of feedback do you have? And I went, we will eat you alive. There's a lot of strong personalities. I think that you are the smartest person in the room. But if you never tell anyone or share your how amazing you are, no one will ever know. And since then, it has been an amazing journey because I've seen her even like in our conversations, she'll just stop, be very calm, look at me and go, no, we're not doing that. Here's what I think. Here's what supports <laughs> it. And this is what we're going to go do. And it's been amazing. And it helped us a lot into the second year as well to be able to communicate in that sense of, if we had differences of where we thought we were, we would stop. I would express my opinion. She would express hers. 99% of the time, it was her opinion. That one. <laughs> because I was like, but there's this very smooth road that could take us to this checkpoint over here. And she goes, no, we're going to take this old mine road that hasn't existed in 50 years, and we will be so much better <laughs> off for it. And I'm like, okay, let's go do it. She's the navigator, right? Absolutely. Have Drive as straight as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Were were there any um were there any scary moments during the the time there? Scary moments. Um I wouldn't necessarily call them scary as much as they were just stressful. Um we were always under a time challenge and Lily can attest to this time is the biggest thing that ever stressed me out cuz we I I'm I'm the one managing the opening and closing times um and they're not in a clean concise time like this one opens at 9 o'clock this one opens at 10 it says like three hours after your opening time. So I have to do the math and figure out 
um, like when we're able to get these checkpoints. Uh, and I'm trying to communicate this to Lily while we're being shaken around the vehicle. So, um, so that was something that was really scary for me whenever we are five checkpoints away and we only have 45 minutes. Mm, um, yeah. So I would, I would just work into a ball stress and, uh, and Lily is very used to that and she, she knows, uh, what makes me stressed. So we worked really well together, uh, to communicate that and just put a plan for the day, make sure we were in this together, um, and make sure I wasn't the one absorbing that ball of stress. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, since you did do this together last year as well, what lessons did you learn last year that you were able to take over to this year and, and helped you improve your performance? Great conflict resolution and how to have a productive <laughs> like, conversation. That's a topic that keeps coming up. <laughs> yeah, we just keep talking about that. I mean, it, it sounds crazy, but I think it applies to most of life too. You can learn any skill. You can take in any kind of new skill, education. That part makes sense. Uh, two plus two equals four. Like you can solve for X. But in order to then communicate that, no one cares if you're right, if you were mean about it. So our biggest point is to understand where the other person was and when to be able to give that feedback. And yes, there is a high part of it in which we were very good and are very good at it because of the fact that we trained at it. But one of our trainers, Bill, kept telling us that you, in a moment of stress, fall back onto your highest level of training. You don't rise to a moment. You're in fight or flight. You're not like, hmm, let me express this new skill that I've never thought of or used before. No, you go, uh, I don't know how to do this, but like, I'll just try to make the next right decision. And what comes through is that understanding of your history and everything you've already done. So luckily for us, it was a lot working it out together. Yeah. And, and just one thing to add to that, um, we really learned the game because the rally, um, it's, it's not something that you can train for completely. Uh, you can't train that on day seven, what it's going to feel like after not getting a good night's sleep and being hungry and having to think, uh, very highly. Um, so, so we really learned the game and what, um, was best for us. Um, I was someone that had to eat at 10 a.m. or else I got really hangry at noon. And that was nothing that I had ever experienced in training before. So it's, uh, it's just stuff like that. And Lily. yeah, Lily knows because she would tell me, like, it's time to eat. You're already hangry. <laughs> She's got timers set on her watch. Alex, it's five till. Let's yeah, an alarm. Yeah. Oh, she she yeah. says it like it was a nice conversation. Sometimes it would literally be, hey, I found are, are you hungry? I think you might need to eat. No, no, no. I'll eat at the next checkpoint. I don't think we're going to make it to the next checkpoint. You need to eat. You need to eat now. No. You drink some water. Your brain is physically like shutting down. Do You have to maintain all. Like, so that's one of the other hardest pieces is you have to show up to be the best teammate and self-manage as much as possible, which sounds crazy, but just to be able to manage your own health, manage your own, getting your own sleep and eating the whole time, because there's so many other things you could prioritize, but the best way you can show up for your teammate and most of your team in the real world is be a complete human when you show up. Make sure that you are as ready as possible, because most of the time you'll probably show up and realize that no one else is ready and you're more ready than everybody else. But it's that self auditing and making sure that you can continue on as well as possible. What what do eating and sleep look like on the rally? Are you given, does everyone like eat the same things or stay in the, do you sleep in tents? Tell me about that. Yeah, I, I think that's the hardest thing on the rally is you are eating dehydrated, like mountain house meals for eight days straight. And last year, it was really hard and you have to think and you have to execute on top of being very low energy and not getting all the nutrients you need. Um, so during the day, uh, yeah, we would we would make our mountain house meals in the morning, usually with the water that's out there for like hot tea or making coffee. Um, and then those lukewarm meals by midday is, is what would sustain us. Uh, but in the evenings, there is a full blown setup for the Rebel Rally. There's a like a huge tent, and a professional chef comes in and and does cook meals for uh, for the competitors. Um, but you are sleeping in tents, uh, tents that you have to set up. There are only one or two showers available, and 65 teams. So that means 100 120 competitors that are all vying for those two showers. Um, so it's you don't 
get all the resources that you do when you're staying in in home, but uh, you make do with what you have. Imagine a road trip from this, like the length of California. And when you have all of these stops, that feeling of waking up, packing up, then go doing whatever activity you wanted to do. And then that feeling of, okay, well, now we need to have another camp. And then we have to set up essentially our whole living situation again. And in certain base camps, you have more infrastructure than others. Like Alex said, the two showers, but is it worth it <laughs> to wait that long? Like, and does it make us more competitive? We have other time. So it's genuinely deciding to shower or have more time to look at our maps. <laughs> so it's making those compromises and decisions as a team. But it's a lot, very much so, you wake up you break down a full camp and then by 5 a.m. you have to go through and plot 40 checkpoints and you're essentially just looking at, I mean, it goes back to basic math on like an X and Y axis and then you're trying to make sure that you plot very accurately because a 0.5 lead could be the width of a football field on a map. So <laughs> accuracy without being able to actually achieve it. So you're getting as close as possible, but Alex is plotting, let's say, anywhere between 20 to 40 checkpoints. And then there's also a driver's meeting where they give you all the information about course, like this section could kill you. Be very, very careful. All of the things that you really need to know. And then there's also something called Enduros. And this is imagine step-by-step -step instructions by an artist. So like a map quest if it was hand-drawn by your kid. So each drawing is what that person interpreted whenever they were at that intersection. So it could genuinely be just an intersection and there's a big boulder picture on your right. But you could pass 20 big boulders <laughs> before getting to that spot. So it's very subjective. You go a distance. And in theory, if your distance matches where they did, you should see the same thing. And all of this is happening before 7 a.m., by the way. We haven't even said 7 a.m. And then you hunt checkpoints. Yeah, yeah take that in. Like, and you have all the competitors doing this and all the staff that go out and do course, I mean, they have to be on course before 7 a.m. If we leave at that time, all of course has to be set up before that time. So it takes an immense amount of amazing people that don't do it because it's a job, but because they love the support of it and what is coming next. And it's really cool. That sounds amazing. Uh, I, I don't think I fully appreciated how strenuous the the rally is uh, for the competitors and probably for all the support people as well. But those eight days, it I mean, it sounds brutal after talking with both of you. It's it's not just a fun off roading drive. It's it's work. It's really hard. Um, I think when people look at the competition and. Um, I hate to say it, but naturally, it's a women's competition. A lot of people assume it's easy. It's it's not. It is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And when we really sit down with people and we explain what we've done, they're like, man, I could not have done that. I, I couldn't have showered for three days alone, let alone uh, wake up at 5 a.m. and have to ch plot checkpoints. Um, but we really are exposed to the elements. We were outside plotting checkpoints in 14 degree weather in Mammoth, California, all the way down to Glamis where it was 110 degrees. And again, we had to fully function and perform at a very high level. Um, so it's it's not easy by any means. Well, outside of the rally, what I'm curious, what is your favorite thing about Rivian vehicles? Maybe it's a feature, maybe it's some piece of behind the scenes engineering that no one ever knows about what what's your favorite thing about whether it's the r1t or the r1s the truck or the suv oh man um i'm going to have to say our interiors and our suspension together um and the reason being uh we did eight days in the car this year we did eight days in the car last year and then all the training on top of that we were really comfortable when we were in the car. Our seats are extremely comfortable. Uh, our HVAC, uh, AC seats and heated seats, um, all of those little luxuries just made the rally um, that much more comfortable when you're in an extremely uncomfortable situation. Um, and then uh, the suspension and what the different trains we had to go over, um, it it just it really focuses on the customer, uh, which was us in that situation, um, and makes it a very uh, bearable situation. Great. And Lily? So 
I'm a bigger fan of the T than the S. I think that both are phenomenal platforms. But since I personally own a yellow T, that's that's where I land. But the so I'm gonna give this in three parts. First, the like hidden I don't know if it's quite hidden, but essentially we take our emblem and then we repeat it in different patterns everywhere that you would just need some kind of crosshatch pattern on different surfaces. So for example, the center charge pad is actually the Rivian emblem repeated over and over. So it's that attention to detail that I think is really cool. And for the experience use side of it, it's the same as Alex said in the sense of we have an we have a hydraulic air ride suspension. Air ride in itself is very useful, but it's also very stiff and doesn't particularly it doesn't transfer weight nearly as well. So whenever you add the hydraulic system into it, it allows for that handling that you love. And third, my absolute favorite part of it is I started in project cars, so I would normally have some very cheap thing that I was trying to make fast, which if it's cheap, it's probably, if you make it fast, it's not reliable. So then I would need a daily driver vehicle. And then if I wanted to off-road, that also, again, if it's cheap, it's not reliable. So for me, this is the first vehicle I've ever owned that could do it and in multiple areas and do it well. We didn't we benchmarked off of two polar opposite vehicles. Like you would normally try to benchmark and say X amount of cup holders or it achieves this amount of like torsion or like whatever it is, you're only looking for X percent better. And we took two polar opposite vehicles, one that would be an off-road expert and the other that would perform perfect at a track. And then we created a vehicle off that. Of course, that's going to pull in opposite directions. But the fact that it does well in all of it not just okay, is my favorite part about our vehicle. Uh, I will second that. It feels like driving a an off-road sports car, like an off-road luxury sports car. Um, uh, I love the details also that you mentioned, Lily, the attention to detail, right? There are these little, just these little things hidden all over, and then you find them, and they're like Easter eggs. You're like, oh, that's so clever. I love that they, <laughs> they put that there. Um, it, it is It is definitely a designed vehicle. It's not, it's, it's as, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess it's as like aesthetic as it is functional. Um, and it does all of those things so, so well. I love the speed personally. Um, we'll, we'll launch the vehicle with the kids in it and they just, they get such a kick out of it. Uh, I think I looked up one time zero to 60 times for Ferraris and the R1T was faster than about half of them, which just blew my mind, right? Half of them while towing a trailer too, by the way. Like it could be towing a trailer Even and better. still beat it zero, zero to 60. That's incredible. I mean, this is like a 7,000 pound truck that's faster, zero to 60 faster than half the Ferraris out there. That's nuts. Yeah. How do you prepare another person that's never been in an EV? I always, I'm like, hey, we're about to take off like a jet because- in an airplane, you're, okay, we're going to take off. We're launching into the sky. That makes sense to most people. But whenever you're like, hey, I'm going to take off quick from this light, by the way, which is more than quick. But, uh, and just that feeling that your body starts to get. We were actually on a drive one time. And while I'm on a track, the gentleman I was with and like we're walking through the vehicle, he starts to like go, what was that? And I'm thinking he's asking me exactly how like the suspension hookups and like what kind of throttle positioning and what kind of input. So my brain instantly starts to go into that engineering of, well, the vehicle's doing this, this, and this based on this input. And he goes, no, 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 my body. What did I just feel? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then my brain just, yeah, I was like, well, I'm not a medical expert. <laughs> it literally yeah. feels like your chest is like collapsing and like lungs are just pressing into the back of the seat. It's It's really, really incredible. Yeah, I, I can't do it with my wife. She does not like that, and I get in trouble. So I have, when my kids are in the car, we have fun, but a lot more safe when the wife is in the car. <laughs> um, all right, one or two more questions, and then we'll, we'll wrap things up here. Um, I'd love to hear from each of you about, specifically within the context of your role as an engineer, what is one thing that frustrates you, and conversely, one thing that brings you joy? Oh, man. Do you want to go first, Lily? You want time to think about it, don't you? That's what that face was. Sure, go for it. <laughs> you know each other so well. <laughs> uh, so what frustrates me most is people uh, because the math will always math. 
and it will make sense. There's a right and a wrong answer. The part will break or it won't. It withstands the forces or it doesn't. And that part I love. It makes complete sense to me. There is an answer to it and we can solve it. We need to maybe get more creative. But with people, I it just doesn't make sense because my brain goes into logic. And I had to learn that there's typically two types of conversation. There's an emotional conversation and a logical one. And I'm normally trying to apply logic to an emotional conversation. And Alex can deeply attest to that one. <laughs> I can also relate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's that's the part that frustrates me the most. Because again, like we can solve any problem. Like we're sending people into space. Like we can figure it out. Yeah. But the people part of it is the hardest part because even whenever you're right, it doesn't matter if it didn't land well or that person didn't understand. So you can make the coolest car. You can design the best parts. But if you can't communicate it and advocate for yourself and your parts, it doesn't matter. And that's the part that frustrates me because the communication side of it is seemingly the most simple, but no one teaches you. And all through school, they're like, here's how you solve these crazy equations. And here's how you get a job. But they don't go, hey, you have to be nice to people. Otherwise, they won't like you. Absolutely. Very well said. All right. I thought about my answer. <laughs> um, I com- First of all, I completely agree with uh, Lily. There's definitely right brains and left brains in all companies. And uh, when we're trying to apply logic to things and it's an emotional conversation, that's very challenging. But um, I think the two things that frustrate me and um, simultaneously bring me joy are all the limitations that you have to fall within when you're designing a part um, as, as any type of design engineer. There's, there's cost, there's mass. Um, like Lily said earlier, we're interfacing with a studio, which is a lot of like artistic uh, creation when it comes to designing vehicle exteriors or interiors. Um, and then you also have supply chain on top of that uh, to actually be able to execute the designs. So all of those limitations can be extremely frustrating when you are just trying to deliver the absolute best product you can for the customer, um, or you're just trying to make your ideas come become a reality. Um, but at the same time, the reason why those bring me so much joy is those are the reasons that we innovate. Um, we innovate using different materials, different designs, different combining different parts um, in ways that we wouldn't have thought of before because the very first idea, if you just run with that, might not be the best idea. Um, so those those definitely both bring me joy and frustration every single day, constantly. Um, but those those really are the reasons that that we innovate. Um, and I can't I can't speak to any of them, but uh, we do have four patents pending in my team currently because of those exact things. We were limited by cost and mass, and we had to think efficiently and and redesign things to make it happen. I love all those parameters that you're talking about where you have to balance one thing against another against another as you're designing some new part or, or system. And it's like a puzzle, right? Which I, I think that's what makes engineering so fun is because it's not just this one thing you have to solve. You have to consider all these these different things and and consolidate them somehow in a way that that overall works the best. Uh, engineers, we love solving problems, and and it's just such a pleasure to be able to do engineering work. Uh, Alex, Lily, thank you so much for being on the show today. What a delight it was to to speak with both of you hear about your experience uh, winning the Rebel Rally this year and and a little bit about some of the engineering, engineering behind the, the, the Rivian platform. Uh, before we end, is there anything that either one of you would like to say, anything that, that we should have talked about that we haven't? Uh, I think the only thing I would say is thank you for sharing our story. Thank you for seeing the importance um, of an EV competing in this competition and, and doing extremely well. Um, and, and you're, providing a platform to amplify um, women in engineering. So I, I really do appreciate that. So one of the things that I did miss was the uh, what brings me joy. And one it was very intentional to join Rivian for me. It was the sense of the thing that I love to do is killing the planet. Like you can't get around that part. And what brings me joy is the fact that the innovation that Alex was talking about is also solving long-term solutions because there is a very real fact of what's next, what comes next, what is the next generation or generations after inheriting. And we have to be smarter about how we do it. Otherwise, it won't exist or it won't be inhabitable. It, all terms there. But what brings me joy is the fact that we 
can provide a different future because of the way that we solve problems. And we have all the answers and we can solve it. So it brings confidence knowing that through engineering, you can look at a problem and go, hey, this whole city needs a solution on a fuel system or a, a fuel cell. Okay. How do we create EVs? What does that life cycle of that look like now? How do we make sure that it pushes us into the future and our why is bigger than just our product? And I think that's the biggest part that brings me joy. So thank it. you for having us. Absolutely. Deeply appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you both so much for being on. How uh, how can people get a hold of you? I'm sure people are going to listen to this and be like, I want to hear more about the Rebel Rally and Rivian and Alex and Lily personally. How can people get a hold of you? Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. My name is Alex Anderson. Um, what I will say is since the rally and since being on a lot of these public speaking events for Rivian, my LinkedIn messages are completely blown up. So I may or may not <laughs> reply, but feel free to feel free to connect me with me. I'm a little bit more difficult in most areas of life, and this one pertains to it as well. So the way you could get a hold of me is if you go out for an adventure, and we'll probably see you out on the trail because I'm very bad at social <laughs> media, and even worse, that I don't even have a LinkedIn because I want those genuine interactions of not that LinkedIn's not genuine, but it's the go have an adventure or take someone with you on an adventure, get outside. I loved how you said it inspired you to want to do more adventures and adventure for everyone is different. You are the direct reason of why we manufacture the way we do and how we make decisions the way we do, because it's in service to getting out and having an adventure. Thank you so much. Well, I am very grateful that that Rivian exists because it has it sounds silly to say like a car, but it really has enhanced my life in certain ways and and I love it. So thank you very much for what what you've done and for being on the show. Um, it's just been a delight to talk with both of you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you like what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening. 